Hello. This is uh, very much of the moment. What is created here is a picture of the composer Anton Bruckner. For this image, I have used as a subject matter this death mask, with one difference, that being that the eyes are open. Because this is very much a resurrection of Bruckner. And what is being resurrected is greater than what it would first appear. The story goes back a long, long way. Glasgow-born UK radio presenter and music journalist Tom Service observed Bruckner's music recalls the late Renaissance music of Giovanni Pierluigi de Palestrina, who was born circa 1525. It's not actually certain of the date. Bruckner also uses the symphonic template of Ludwig van Beethoven with the rich harmonies of Richard Wagner. And Bruckner's music looks very much to a future age. But it is his symphony, his ninth symphony, that is very much of this moment. To paraphrase uh, Tom Service, Bruckner's music seems to span time, crossing the centuries, collapsing both time and space, so you hear everything and nothing in a moment. Bruckner departed this world on the 11th of October 1896. In the morning of that day, he was still doing the finishing touches to his Ninth Symphony. But it has taken no less than 126 years for this Ninth Symphony to be fully realised. Now notice 126 years, so that's one and two and six equals nine, and we're talking about a ninth symphony. Nine is also the number of completion of man. But the story actually goes further back than this. We have to go back to the period 1480 Anno Domini and 1512 Anno Domini, a span of 32 years. The two dates mark the completion of the Sistine Chapel. Now, I should point out, it is all about the spell, Sistine. It is a cyst in energy because of the way it has been used. You have the famous ceiling painting by Michelangelo, which is basically a play on words on Archangel Michael. It's a figure that also is depicted musically by Bruckner in his eighth symphony known as the Apocalypse, as a sort of unofficial nickname at various times in its history. Now this famous Sistine Chapel painting, I wonder how many of you have really seen what is being displayed there. That famous creation image of Adam representing man and then God. But notice that the fingers do not touch. Now on a superficial level, you've got this ingrained image of this old man in the sky, which is uh, how a lot of people seem to picture God, some sort of old man figure up in the clouds, as it were. But that is a very superficial level on which to look at that image. What it is actually showing you is there is nothing between man and God. That is why the fingers are not touching. But it is also displaying that if you look up and externally outside of yourself, you will see a separation of man from the creator within. Incidentally, Bruckner 
has become known as God's composer. And as a reminder, as I have said before, Anton means divine one. Bruckner in English means bridge, so he is the, the bridging of the divine one. What Bruckner has given you in the Ninth Symphony is something that surpasses the entire Sistine Chapel painting. That is a visual art. But it is allegorical, it is metaphorical. It is not to be taken literally. Look again at God. You'll notice there are 12 figures in that red. What should we say that is? A pineal gland? It is basically showing you that there is no separation, but everything comes from nothing between the pineal gland and the man. Notice that the Adam figure is on Earth, because you are a co-creator on Earth. But if you use your imagination, you can co-create within this reality. There is a saying in English about punching your lights out, and that is exactly what I propose to do here. It implies a physical punch of knocking the day lights out of someone. I, that is, in other words, to punch them in the eyes, give them two black eyes. I think uh, many of you are familiar with that black eye symbology with a moon eye, for example that is shown by many, shall we say, celebrities and well-known personalities. But I digress. Round the uh, top of the Sistine Chapel, just below the ceiling, are a series of 32 lights, skylights, windows. And between those are 30 panels allegedly depicting the 30 popes up to the time of 1512, when the Sistine Chapel painting was completed by Michelangelo. Interesting that, 1512. Then we have 2012, in which this Ninth Symphony finale of Bruckner was realised. We'll come on to more about that in a little while. But going back to the lights around the top of the, the windows, around the top of the Sistine Chapel, then you've got between the eyes, between the lights, you have figures. It is all metaphorical messages. Your third eye is right between your two physical eyes, the two eyes to look and one to observe. Now I say that the Ninth Symphony is very much of a moment because that surpasses the Sistine Chapel in what it displays in sound. If we take the arts, the highest art and the one that stands above all others is music because it is the one that is brought to life by living beings. It requires no external object to create. It doesn't need to be inspired by an external object. It is all done from the imagination, as Bruckner has done. It is very much of this moment, historically, if we look at the Ninth Symphony. Now, it was first published by a well-meaning student of Bruckner's called Joseph Schulk in 1903 one year after the a phoenix year. I'm going to bring in the chronology and what this reveals because this is impossible to separate because there is no separation. Again, that is shown in the Sistine Chapel. If you look at those two fingers, they are not touching because everything comes from nothing. That should be emphasized, I feel. So the Ninth Symphony, it consists, like all Bruckner symphonies, of four movements. But thanks to Joseph Schulk, it put in place a publicly held view which is reinforced by the music world of it being a three-movement torso, 
with an incomplete finale, the, the rantings of a madman who's lost his mind, referring to Bruckner. That is far from the truth. It took until 1934, when somebody had the sensible idea of actually looking at the original manuscript scores by Bruckner that he had bequeathed to the what is now the Vienna State Library. So he left his legacy of his creations of his symphonic diary, his dialogue of this journey from birth to death and beyond. I think it's fair that many of you will have seen from March 2020 the uh, general theme that is being played out on this world stage is a separation of self from spirit. That is reflected in this Ninth Symphony because the public and the record companies have all got used to playing a three movement ninth symphony, an incomplete symphony. Bruckner called his third movement, the Adagio, his farewell to life. It is the end of the physical mortal being. The finale of this ninth symphony goes into another world. What is depicted here is the railings of St. Florian monastery representing the gates of heaven and Bruckner coming back out from the dead. Incidentally, his uh, body is buried below the what is now known as the Bruckner organ in the St. Florian, St. Florian monastery in Austria. And it is mummified and it was restored in recent years and apparently looks as fresh as the day he died. But a bit of a clue here. The physical avatar now lacks life. It is just a mummy. It is just a corpse that is artificially embalmed and kept preserved. But it can do nothing of itself because the spirit of Bruckner is now free. It has been released unto the world. Very relevant for today. This finale of the Ninth Symphony is the journey beyond the beauty of this as as a commentator has said on a recent video upload i'll come more onto that later but basically it would fit the idea of the catholic uh, belief of purgatory and a forgiving creator but that's a very superficial level and i would refer you back to look at that pineal gland that is being shown on the sistine chapel it is an archetype, it is a representation, it is not intended to be taken that literal. There is always a deeper meaning in things, the same as with this Bruckner Ninth Symphony. It is only when you internalise it and you feel that music inside that it reveals its true message. 126 years to complete. It was left open-ended, as it were, deliberately. If we look at the composition process and the, t of the time span of this Ninth Symphony, it was commenced in 1887 by Bruckner. There are sketches of even the f finale themes, the what is the zigzags, uh, sound what is known as the crucifix theme. It's a basically a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. At the opening of this finale, it is the resurrection, it is where the spirit departs the body and goes into the beyondness. Bruckner knew that his creations in sound were not for his time so he went through a period of what is known as revision mania we get to an isometric marker of about 1892 and this is where things really start to happen with Bruckner as a physical being this reality is all about experience what Bruckner is expressing in this ninth symphony 
is from a, a position of experience. So, of course, he has had to go through an experience. And he certainly did that. On the 24th of March, 1893, his health had deteriorated that he had the last sacraments read, expecting that he was going to die. But no, he makes a recovery, a miraculous recovery. He revises other works. He carries on writing and creating this Ninth Symphony. So from that experience, of that near-death experience has enabled him to write the first three movements. So the first movement of the Ninth Symphony was completed on the 23rd of December, 1894, followed on the 15th of February, 18, sorry, the 23rd of February, 1893, followed on the 15th of February by the, by the second movement, the Scherzo. His health was such that his birthday celebrations at uh, Steyr were cancelled that year, which would have been his 70th birthday on the 4th of September. But he perseveres, and on the 30th of November, 1894, he completes the third movement, the Adagio, his farewell to life. Now, interestingly, on the 30th of November this year, 2022, is that realisation of this symphony. There is a performance being given, a premiere, by the London Philharmonic under Robin Ticati, I think is his surname. It's an Italian surname. I apologise for the pronunciation. But it is T-I-C-C-I-A-T-I. -I -I. So that's 126 years after this symphony was created. The myth has grown up that that fourth movement was incomplete, but that is far from the truth. His doctor, uh, Dr. Richard Heller, is the only mortal that has ever heard this finale played by Bruckner himself on a piano. And Dr. Heller describes the themes about, about the coda and the alleluia that is brought back into this uh, finale of the symphony, it was complete. But I think you'll agree that there seems to be a control system in this reality that seems to have its fingers in every pie. So it would not be inconceivable that that finale, the critical missing bifolios in Bruckner's hand have gone missing and a few other bridging parts within the symphony. But fortunately, Bruckner was very meticulous. It is often pointed that he had this counting neurosis. People seem to forget he was an organist, he was an improviser. You have to think about how Bruckner would have composed. He was very meticulous to number all the pages of every score, to number the bar lines, to look at the balance of the structure of his symphonies. He did the same with his study of the template of his symphonies with Ludwig van Beethoven. The numbers, the numerology and everything, Bruckner was very much aware of. Bruckner has also been described as a mystic. Certainly his Eighth Symphony depicts his own death where he dies in his sleep and all that is left is the ticking clock, which is shown musically and sonically at the end of the first movement of the Eighth Symphony. So turning now to this finale, it is the fourth movement. It has taken four decades for some leading musicologists to actually realise by reconstructing this Ninth Symphony, playing musical detectives, looking at Bruckner's composing process, they are quite qualified to do so. We have Nicola Semele, an Italian composer, Giuseppe Musacca, also an Italian composer, 
we have Benjamin Gunner Kors, a German conductor and music scholar. And finally, Dr. John A. Phillips, an Australian music teacher and musicologist. Very interestingly, if you were to look at a map of the world and you join the dots, you have two in Italy. Now take that line across to Germany. Now take that line straight down from Germany to Australia. I think you'll see you have something that looks very much like the number seven, divide the, the number of divinity, because that is what Bruckner's ninth is. It is talking and expressing the creator. It is expressing creation itself. It surpasses the Sistine Chapel in that, because it leaves the visualization to your imagination. Now this uh, finale was all but complete in 2012. It has been championed by the Berlin Philharmonic under Sir Simon Rattle. It has been recorded by EMI and it has been a great commercial and public success. Like I say, it reflects very much the moment. Just as with this, shall we say, language lessons of the heart, walking that spiritual path, that self-discovery, it requires stepping out of the comfort zone. This is being reflected because the public now have to step out of their comfort zone of a three-movement Ninth Symphony, which Bruckner never intended. You have to embrace something new, something unknown. You have to now have a new perspective on it. The emphasis of the symphony for the conductor now changes. Sir Simon Rattle has to hold back in those first three movements rather than culminating with the third movement and then giving it all in that fourth movement because it is all about the all. It is about the creator. It is about you. It is about I. It is dedicated by Bruckner to the highest of high, to the Lord of Lords, to the dear Creator. That is why, because I know time is not linear, I know who I am, so I accept the dedication. I am the dedicatee. So it's very interesting. It is... Um, Dr. John A. Phillips, who's out on a limb from the other three, the other three um, musicologists who completed this finale are in Europe, but Dr. John A. Phillips is in Australia. It reflects also how with the Kundalini rising, you've got to go from the place of the sun and go down to the base. You could say that Australia is at the bottom of the world, as it were. And thanks to Dr. John A. Phillips, he re-examined this Ninth Symphony from this 2012 edition, <coughs> excuse me, and has now furnished the world by, by taking a re-examination of the drafts and all the notes that Bruckner has left and given us a far cleaner, far more accurate finale. Now, it is always going to be thrown that it is not in the hand of the composer. But as Dr. John A. Phillips has pointed out, the symphony was fragmented, just like the creator has been fragmented into co-creators to experience this reality. The micro and the macro are clear to be seen in all of this within oneself and externally of oneself. That is why I say this music is very much of the moment. It is of now. So 30th of November, 1894, the completion of the Adagio, the Farewell to Life. The 30th of November, 2022, sees the premiere of the entire work. In a form that is as close as you're ever going to get because it is in the hand of Bruckner effectively but it is a living symphony 
It reflects this separation of spirit in the nature of the history of, of the symphony. It is reflecting the history of humanity with what is going on today, with its intention to separate man from spirit through the most devious and misleading means, in the same way that the Sistine Chapel images have been taken in a very misleading and very superficial way. Now interestingly, it's 198 years since Bruckner was born on the 4th of September 1824. In two years time, it is the bicentenary, 200 years since Bruckner's birth. As this four movement symphony, as was intended, becomes established in the minds of the public, and becomes complete. By 2026, we will see this symphony where it rightfully should be, surpassing the Sistine Chapel in all that it shows in sound, in feeling, in internalizing the feelings of what that music expresses. Bruckner very much is God's composer. He is an artist. He is a he art, a human energy of art. He is the medium of the expression of creation of imagination. That is what art is all about, and the Aquarian Age is very much about creation and art. That is why this Ninth Symphony is very much of the moment. It is talking about now and refer, referring back to that Tom Service, um, basically to paraphrase him, because I can't remember the exact words, but basically with Bruckner you get everything and nothing in a moment. He collapses time and space. It is a creation from a creator using a human avatar as a medium to express creation itself. I feel it will not be, ever be surpassed. No other composer has gone to the deepest, darkest reaches of what would be described as purgatory and revealed what is beyond death. <coughs> Incidentally, the background depiction I've added into this image is a sort of impression of the Vienna, Vienna Theatre fire in which 455 people died, which Bruckner expresses in the Seventh Symphony in the Adagio movement. Behind Bruckner on the other side you have an impression of St. Florian Monastery and a, a sort of a, a representation of the Bruckner organ pipes. So yes, Bruckner is very much a resurrected spirit and is still as relevant today as he has always been and is part of an ongoing story. It is expressed to humanity through art in all mediums, in all forms, but perhaps it is music that it expresses it most. You shut out the external world and just listen and feel and let it wash over you. See what it brings out for you. For my part, I'm going to introduce Bruckner to the greater world. It's about time he was acknowledged for the creations he had a very hard life, what he went through, what he endured, he persevered because he knew he had a very important message for humanity. That is what the spirit of Bruckner is truly all about. Love to you all and I will put links in the description to the Simon Rattle and Berlin Philharmonic performance. I will link you to the realisation um, in its latest form uh, in a Sibelius 
program by Dr. John A. Phillips. I'll link to his channel so you can listen to it for yourself. It, I thoroughly recommend it, but uh, ideally you want to listen to all four movements, let the whole thing unfold. It's, it's interesting, it's nine, basically 90 minutes of expression of the journey of experience of life. Yes, so Bruckner, he had his last rites read three times. Now, it, it's interesting that it spans these, uh, this Ninth Symphony. He had the last rites read before finalising the first three movements, this, where you leave the mortal world. Then he had the last rites read again, made a miraculous recovery. Then he was able to write the finale, which effectively was complete um, by the 11th of August. It's the last date in the score. It was just tidying and finishing and the orchestration to be added in. It is effectively all there. Somebody out there has those missing bifolios. Interestingly, Bruckner spent his, his last few months of his life when he was unable to climb stairs in a lodge house called Belvedere which was owned by Count Lichtenstein. Lichtenstein means bright stone. It is right next to Switzerland. Make of that what you will. But the spirit needs no material facts to unearth these things because the spirit goes where the physical cannot and sees across time and sees across space, it, it collapses, just as Bruckner's symphony reveals in sound. So I will say I love to you all, and may this revelation stand as a testimony, testimony of the history, the future history of the symphony. I feel 2112 will be a very significant year. You've got 1512 with the creation of the ceiling. That gives the isometric marker of 1812, a time when Europe at least, and probably the wider world, changed. So what will happen in 2112? Notice the numerology of 2112. Interesting, eh? Food for thought there, and plenty to weigh up and listen to. Love to you all, and ta-ta for now.